about rain gardens tonight. Uh, it's something that I did a lot of teaching on and have spent a lot of time studying and going out to see beautiful rain gardens. I am going to turn off my camera and we'll have just my webinar on the screen. And then uh, when we get to questions, I'll turn my camera back on. But note I'm here. <laughs> I'm just going to uh, make my camera turn off. All right. So I'm hoping that a good portion of our audience this evening might be gardeners like myself. And I know that some of you are master gardeners. But regardless of your interests, welcome to you all. And want to, oops, let's get my screen rolling here. There we go. As gardeners, we spend a lot of time outside coaxing things to grow, getting our hands in the dirt and witnessing the wonders of nature. We're land stewards. And though may you, not, or you may not have thought about it, that also makes you a water steward. Now, right around the corner, the 22nd of this month is the 51st Earth Day celebration. But for gardeners, every day is Earth Day, right? As gardeners, we're accustomed to thinking about protecting our water resources by conserving water. So in terms of quantity, but we don't always think about how our gardening practices may impact water quality. So today I'll share with you why it's important to think about water quality when we garden and how rain gardens in particular can help keep our water clean and plentiful. Water makes our planet unique in the universe. It's a finite precious resource that never leaves our atmosphere. The water we have today existed for hundreds of millions of years and continues to cycle. A drop of water that falls on my driveway in Port Orchard could have been a drop in the Ganges or swirling around the Humboldt ocean currents recently. And what we do to our local waterways and the creatures they sustain does make a difference the world over. Installing a rain garden is a great way to protect water quality. And this class will cover the basics of rain gardens as techniques to protect the salmon stream near your home and the water we drink. My goal today is to give you some tools to determine if a rain garden is appropriate for your property and the resources you'd need to design and install one. Because I can't cover everything worth knowing about rain gardens in our short time this evening, I have created a handout that Erica mentioned with online links that can help you learn more. She'll be sending this handout out as a PDF after the class, and it includes resources specific to Clark County and Western Washington in general. Several years ago, I had the pleasure of being part of a team of scientists and educators contributing to the update of the Rain Garden Handbook for Western Washington. This publication is the foundation of this webinar's content and it will be your best, most thorough resource for all things Rain Garden if you live west of the Cascades. It'll help you plan, build, plant, and maintain your rain garden according to the very specific needs of your individual site. The link to download this free PDF of the full color handbook is included in the handout for the webinar, but also appears on this slide. Following the webinar, it will also be available on my garden blog and it's available from the Department of Ecology. So it's very easy to find online with a simple Google search. Any discussion of rain gardens must start with an overview of the hydrologic cycle or water cycle. It's a beautiful and complex system that we don't often give thought to. This slide illustrates the water cycle before European colonization, so before our urban development, houses, roads, and driveways. Notice in this drawing how water is cycled in terms of percentages. You'll see that the plentiful trees and canopy are key components of the water cycle, slowing down and softening the impact of pounding rain on the soil surface thus preventing erosion and allowing a good portion of that rain to immediately evaporate into the atmosphere again without even reaching the ground. You see that only about 1% of the rain ends up running off the surface of the ground. The rest soaks into groundwater 
slowly seeping out over the spring and summer seasons to recharge, replenish streams and lakes and the water table. The roots take up a good portion of the water and plants release it as water vapor in the process of photosynthesis. An incredible 40 to 50% of the water that falls as precipitation goes right back into the air as water vapor with the presence of historical forests and understory that our region was originally blessed with. And looking at the water cycle today, after modern human development, the movement of water is altered dramatically when it no longer falls on trees and rich native thick soil built up with decades of duff and debris. In our modern age, 20 to 30% of the rain becomes surface runoff, rushing off roofs and paving right into the creek or the Washougal River. Pre-development, this number was only 1%. No longer is precipitation slowed and intercepted by trees and healthy soil. The volume of water, as well as the speed of the water that flows off hard surfaces is now unprecedented. This brings us to the term stormwater runoff. It's what happens to rain when it falls on expanses of bare ground and hard impervious surfaces. It's the leading cause of water pollution in urban areas, the Puget Sound, the Columbia, and it's a national and international problem. The changes we have made to the water cycle through land development have wide reaching negative impacts. Stormwater becomes a bath of toxic chemicals from our cars, homes, yards, and industry that poisons and kills salmon and all types of aquatic life, becoming particularly toxic of the food chain for beautiful creatures like our, our iconic orca, it contains pathogens like E. coli that close lakes to swimming, and it compromises the purity and the safety of our drinking water. The combined physical effects of the speed and volume of stormwater runoff causes erosion that destroys habitat, smothers aquatic organisms with sediment, and causes flooding and property damage. But understanding how and why stormwater pollution is a problem allows us to address it. And I wanna recommend a very engaging five minute video created by Washington State University and the Nature Conservancy that explains more about the research into the impacts of stormwater runoff, in particular on coho salmon and how we can play a role in reducing it. Since we don't have time during this presentation, I encourage you to follow the link in the handout after the class. The video is well worth your time. And again, that's one put together by WSU and the Nature Conservancy. Green stormwater solutions, low impact development, green stormwater infrastructure. These are all different terms for the same suite of techniques that address stormwater pollution by trying to get more of our rain to infiltrate into the ground on the location where it falls. The fancy definition aside, the goal of green stormwater solutions is to have our properties function more like the land did before it was developed, closer to that pre-development water cycle. These techniques can be as low tech as planting more trees and improving the soil in our gardens. The goal is to help more rain soak into the ground in your yard and less to run off your property as stormwater. And what little does leave your driveway or garden, we want ideally to be cleaner because we're reducing what chemicals we use in our garden and home. Using one or more of these techniques can reduce the impacts of stormwater pollution and be attractive at the same time. Rain and gardens are a useful stormwater solution for the residential property owner with many benefits such as capturing, slowing and infiltrating rain on site neutralizing toxins before the water percolates into the groundwater and wells, and attracting wildlife, make it a favorite technique of gardeners. I want to explain now the difference between bioretention and a rain garden. They're very similar techniques, but they have sometimes subtle differences. Bioretention facilities are engineered. 
Sometimes this is because the huge volume of water they handle, maybe from a whole neighborhood or an entire roadway. And they're tied intricately into municipal drainage infrastructure. Note the caged drain gate and concrete basin. Sometimes the engineering is needed because the location and the site are more challenging with strict requirements for permitting and construction as a result. Rain gardens, however, are not engineered. They handle a smaller volume of water and are usually installed in someone's yard as a standalone feature, not in conjunction with a new build or remodel and not tied into drainage infrastructure. So a rain garden is less complex than bioretention and plainly described, it is a shallow depression in the ground that captures stormwater from your single family home. It might intercept water from your roof drains or maybe just the water that flows off your back patio. It's planted in a way that blends in nicely with the rest of your garden and you as the homeowner maintain it. It's built to handle the kind of pollutants that come off your driveway or lawn. Rain gardens can help reduce flooding of your own property or a neighbor's property and make a positive contribution by reducing the volume of water that can collectively overwhelm your neighborhood and your city's sewer system during heavy rain events. Rain gardens are simple solutions to stormwater problems, but we have to have the right site. And the most important thing to understand about rain gardens is that they must be installed in well-draining soils where rain can reliably infiltrate. A properly functioning rain garden should completely drain no longer than 72 hours after it stops raining, ideally sooner. By the way, I sometimes get asked about mosquitoes being a problem for rain gardens. But since mosquitoes take four to seven days in standing water to become adults after the eggs are laid, this shouldn't be an issue with a rain garden because it's designed to drain within that 72 hours. Now don't confuse a rain garden with a pond. Ponds are built with liners to prevent rain from draining out, while rain gardens are purposefully built to let it all soak in. Rain gardens are not for every location, especially not for soggy wet areas of standing water. If you have a pond or want one, just a caution, you don't wanna direct any storm water into locations where pollution can sit and concentrate. If you have wet, saturated soils for all or part of the year and are looking for a solution, I suggest a bog garden. Bog gardens are created by selecting plants that thrive in that heavy, wet soil that lacks oxygen. And sometimes the addition of these plants will help the area be less wet. In any case, it's a useful way to create beautiful gardens and wildlife habitat in an otherwise challenging location. It's all about not fighting the site, but planting to accommodate the existing condition. A rain garden is a shallow depression with gradually sloping sides and where the existing soil has been excavated and amended with high quality compost. And then it's refilled so it can be completely level and porous and have an infiltrating base, leveled here, labeled here as the rain garden soil mix. Now in this diagram, notice the arrows where water enters as an inflow and exits with an overflow when the rain garden becomes too full to handle any more water. A rain garden when full is designed to be six to 12 inches deep in the center. And this is referred to the ponding depth. A rain garden is a tool that harnesses the elegant and powerful symbiotic relationships between plants, soil, and soil microorganisms to infiltrate water and clean it in the process. The physical, biological, and chemical properties of these three components together are an ecological powerhouse. It doesn't take long after a rain garden is built for plant roots to take up water for roots and microorganisms to filter the groundwater and create natural pathways for that water to get into the ground again. 
microorganisms in short time, tie up, neutralize, or break down toxins of all kind, from the oil on your driveway, to the copper from your brake pads, to the weed and feed from, well, our neighbor's lawn, right? And then as a rain garden matures, it becomes habitat for birds and amphibians. And if you include flowering plants, your rain garden can be pollinator habitat as well. When it comes to evaluating your property to see if you have a good spot for a rain garden, the first thing you want to consider is that you'll be directing water into the ground. So you must avoid doing that in your underground infrastructure. So what's underground? Well, as a landscaper for many years, I've seen a lot of expected and unexpected things buried. Utilities, septic system, wells, or maybe even components that are no longer functioning, like an old heating oil tank. You also want to avoid being too close to structures to prevent water damage in particular to basements. Steep slopes and retaining walls are other things to avoid as soil saturation can make them unstable. And of course, we don't wanna infiltrate polluted stormwater near the water bodies we are trying to protect from pollution in the first place. When it comes to site assessment, the Rain Garden Handbook will be invaluable to you to evaluate your own site with easy to follow checklists of what things to look out for. And the handbook reminds us that if a rain garden is part of a new construction project or remodel, the requirements for your county or city are likely to be different than if you're adding a rain garden to your established property without other construction. Finding a good location starts during a heavy rain. Get your rain boots on, go out and follow the water. Look at your downspouts and see where all that water from your roof goes. If the downspouts discharge di directly on the ground, it can cause flooding issues for basements or crawl spaces. Does it flow over the driveway maybe? Flow down the sidewalk? Does it make it into a nearby storm drain that's in the street? In all of these situations, Getting some or all of that runoff away from structures and into a rain garden is our goal. Now, not everyone is aware of this, but runoff that goes into a storm drain will end up untreated into a nearby river or shoreline. So whatever rain we can put into a rain garden is less that goes into a storm drain and becomes pollution. Rain gardens should be located 10 feet away from structures on relatively flat ground, but also hopefully downgrade a little bit where gravity will help us get water into the rain garden. In my photo, you can see how the downspout is piped into the rain garden as an inflow. And the angle of it makes it look closer to the foundation than it actually is. It's about 15 feet away. A note here, if you're lucky enough to still have areas of trees and native vegetation on your property, you want to keep and protect those. Remember, we're trying to mimic the hydrology of a forested area, not remove more. Those heavily planted native areas can sometimes be a good spot to direct the water that leaves a rain garden when it gets too full, but not disturbed or removed in order to install one. Lawns are ideal locations typically. Once you think you have a good spot for a rain garden, then it's time to investigate the soil and see how well it drains. Detailed instructions for performing a perk test can be found in the rain garden handbook, and it includes a list of helpful tools in order to do your perk test. Before you dig, verify the exact location of your utilities, and that can be done by calling 811 and making an appointment for a utility locate. If you have a septic system or well, you'll want to check your property's records carefully for the location of these components, and you can do that through the Public Health District. These resources are listed on your handout for reference later. 
Now, don't worry about memorizing the introduction about perk tests. All of these steps are laid out in a very prescriptive, easy to follow fashion in the handbook. And I find it's easier to absorb this information as you're actually performing the steps for yourself. Once you have confirmed the location is free from underground infrastructure, it's time to dig that two foot by two foot hole you'll use to determine your soil drainage rate. And as you dig, rub the soil in your hands to learn a little bit about its texture. Is it gritty sand? Is it slick like sil silty soil? Or maybe it's sticky with a lot of clay co um, component. Use a yardstick or a piece of PVC pipe that you mark the inches on with a Sharpie in order to gauge how long it takes the water to drain out. The stopwatch on your smartphone works great for this. Then you divide the total inches of water you started with in the hole by the total hours it takes to drain. On my sandy property, I'm dividing the inches by a fraction of an hour. For heavy clay soils, this could take several hours, so I recommend starting your perk test in the morning. When the soil is naturally wet, it's the perfect time for a perk test. You'll get an accurate soil drainage rate. This month is a great time. Repeat the test multiple times, especially if you're doing it in the dry summer months. Your rate is likely to change from one test to the next if the soil was very dry to start with. So typically it's recommended to do this soil drainage test November through April, typically, when the soils are getting wet. Here's an example from the Rain Garden Handbook of a drainage rate calculation. So it's all laid out in a very straightforward fashion. If your drainage rate is above a tenth of an inch in, of an out, in an hour, it may be possible to have a rain garden in that location, but it's gonna need to be bigger in size and deeper than if the soil drained faster. The better your soil drains, the smaller your rain garden will need to be in order to incorporate, to infiltrate the same volume of water. Here's a list of the factors the Rain Garden Handbook walks us through to determine if a rain garden is possible. And if so, what size it will need to be. Once you know your soil drainage rate, then you measure the length and width of your roof or other hard surface, also called contributing area. You calculate that square footage. And don't worry about measuring surfaces such as this driveway that aren't perfectly square. Just measure as close as you can to the length and width. The Rain Garden Handbook has colorful maps for all of Western Washington to help determine your average annual precipitation for your region. And you can see here, it looks like there's a tiny little section of, of region one in there. Um, a little of region two, yeah, a, a, a good mix, but you can see anywhere from less than 30 inches to it looks like greater than 90 inches in Clark County. Use the sizing chart from the handbook to determine the sizing factor that is specifically tailored to your drainage rate and your rainfall. Step-by-step, step, the Rain Garden Handbook walks you through calculating how big your rain garden will need to be to infiltrate the volume of water that comes off the hard surfaces that you measured. You do this by multiplying the sizing factor from that chart by the square footage of your contributing area. Sometimes on small lots or with poorly draining soils, you might only have room to infiltrate just a part of your roof say from one downspout, which can still be a lot of water. In urban areas or areas with small yards, sometimes there isn't enough room to fit a rain garden where it's away from structures and utilities. And sometimes it's just that your soil doesn't infiltrate well enough to get water to soak in within 72 hours or less. 
Now, if your calculations determine that you do have the room and the soils to accommodate a rain garden, it's on to chapter two called build. And this is where you design the rain garden, shaping it to fit your designated location, and you plan the inflow and the outflow. In my photograph, you can see we remove the lawn. We have marked lines on the ground to guide the excavation of the rain garden. We've confirmed the slope away from the downspout that will feed into the rain garden. And I will explain a little bit more about these various lines on the ground in a slide or two. Just like it did for the perk test, the handbook provides a helpful list of tools needed for construction. When planning how the rain enters and exits, inflows enter the rain garden on the side closest to the source of the water. Downspouts are often piped in. Never use corrugated pipe. It clogs, it's impossible to clean, and it crushes easily. If you're going to pipe underground, use a smooth walled pipe, or you could also simply direct the water away from the foundation using a splash block and direct the water over the surface of the ground using a rock lined swale. From a parking area or driveway surface, a cut in a curb or simply large cobble rock right off the edge is a perfectly fine inflow. Outflows are often as simple as a shallow rock line channel that when the rain garden is full, allows it to drain in a sheet over a lawn that gently slopes towards the storm drain, soaking in some in the grass along the way. Large rock slows the flow of water and prevents erosion. And so always use it to armor the inflow and the outflow. Next thing to consider before you excavate the rain garden is the rain garden soil mess, which is the soil that is leveled in the bottom of the rain garden after it has been initially excavated. If your rain garden, if your native soil is sandy and well draining, then you might consider amending it with quality compost and reusing as much of the soil as you can. If the soil is poor, you can purchase rain garden soil mixes that are a 60-40 mix of sand and compost. The rain garden handbook has several options for soil preparation, depending on your situation. And if you notice in the diagram, when the rain garden soil mix is returned to that depression, it should be 12 to 24 inches deep. And this is the porous and completely leveled layer of soil in the base of the rain garden. This is the part that does the major work of removing toxins from stormwater. Small rain gardens can be exca excavated by hand with several friends or if larger with equipment. We're counting on the soil to infiltrate, so avoid compaction during construction. Once refilled and leveled, tamp it down only gently with your feet. Never use equipment inside of the rain garden itself. Once the rain garden soil mist is in place and gently tamped, filling it with water will help settle the soil. It will also show you if it's soaking in evenly on the bottom, and that helps verify whether it's totally level. It will also demonstrate how your outflow functions. If it's not draining evenly or the outflow is not at the right level, this is the time to adjust that. If the outflow is too low, you won't get the ponding depth you need and it will overflow too quickly. If the outflow is high, the water could flood over the top and, or potentially back into the inflow. Now let's talk plants. <laughs> this is my favorite part of rain gardens, naturally as a horticulturist. They accomplish an amazing suite of things from helping remove the pollutants to getting that water back into the water cycle the way it was before human development. And of course, as gardeners, we value the beauty and the wildlife food and habitat that they provide. To know what kind of plants can be used in a rain garden, we have to understand the zones. 
Zone one is the deepest part, that level bottom that infiltrates rainwater and is saturated most of the winter months. Zone two is the sloped parts, the sides that are saturated on and off in the winter. And zone three, which is the top outside edge of the rain garden, isn't much different from the rest of the surrounding landscape in terms of soil and wetness. Zat zone three is the top outside edge of the rain garden that wasn't excavated as part of the rain garden construction. Here's another diagram to help you visualize those zones. Zone one is wet, zone two is transition, and zone three is the dry. By the way, you don't want your slopes to be like this. These are exaggerated in this drawing. You want them to be more gentle so that they don't erode. Coming back to this slide, these lines represent those planting zones and how we're going to excavate the bottom. The sloping sides of zone two and the top outside planted edge of zone three. So we start digging in that in those in that middle line. And when we get that, then we work out towards the slopes. As we decide on what plants to use, we consider that rain gardens are landscape amenities, and they can be as simple or as elaborate as we like. They should complement the surrounding garden. It's tempting to want to include a huge variety of plants. However, some of the most beautiful rain gardens that I've seen and the easiest to maintain have very simple plant palettes with only three to five species of plants. And this one on the left is decidedly more rock. It's more of a xeriscaping, if you will. Uh, this is in a natural park where the ability to irrigate it is uh, is not there. There's no uh, hose bib um, or sprinklers or anything like that available. Rain garden plants have specific requirements and not just whether they need sun or shade, which is of course important, but they need to be able also to tolerate summer drought that is exacerbated by the fact that the soil in a rain garden is fast draining by design. We also need plants that don't require pest control or fertilization because our goal is to remove chemicals and not add them. And of course, all plants, even in rain gardens, need supplemental water in the summer months in order to become established. So if the plant can't go through the summer without a lot of extra irrigation, it's probably not your right choice. Now I've seen a lot of rain gardens and I recommend doubling the plant spacing that you would planting something in a normal landscape situation. Loose, nutrient-rich, compost-amended soil and plenty of water causes rain garden plants to rapidly exceed the growth that you would see in a normal landscape planting. You don't want to have this cousin it overwhelming all the other plants, blocking your view of the sidewalk, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to have to yank something out disturbing the rain garden level that you worked so hard to install or spend precious time pruning like crazy only to have something look ugly and stunted. So again, exaggerate your spacing. It's much, much easier and less expensive to add plants two to three years later if you need them than it is to rip things out. The choices of plants for all the zones is as wild, wide as your imagination. But the Rain Garden Handbook has an extensive plant list with photos and descriptions to help guide you to proven selections that have been used successfully throughout our region. There's even sample planting plans too for different exposures and with plants that make good companions, uh, both in terms of their function and their aesthetics. Now, usually the plants chosen for that bottom wet zone one are rushes, sedges, bulrushes. These are plants that can easily tolerate being completely underwater, something, sometimes for days. They're vigorous and they fill in on the bottom in a matter of a season or two. 
Now the Rain Garden Handbook plant list includes native and non-native plant selections. The original Rain Garden Handbook concluded only native plants on the plant list. And part of the reason we wanted to expand that list was to include non-natives, since many of our natives are hard to accommodate because of their large size at maturity. Natives though, many of them are super adaptive to a variety of conditions, sun and shade, drought and wet, and that makes them really versatile and useful in rain gardens. The new plant list includes a lot of compact cultivars of some of the natives that we use a great deal of in rain gardens, like this Kelsey red twig dogwood. It's, it's an extreme dwarf, often used in zone one. Cooley's hedge nettle is one of my favorites. It's a lovely showy native that's a pollinator plant that hummingbirds love. Mock orange is showy too and fragrant, but it can reach 12 feet. And there are compact cultivars of mock orange, but even they reach five to eight feet. So plant choices are gonna depend on the overall size of your rain garden. Pay attention to mature sizes. And again, know that they're likely to exceed the growth on the plant tag in a rain garden setting. Generally what is suggested is a combination of plant types for both aesthetic reasons and reasons of water uptake function. Roots of grasses, for instance, function differently in water uptake and soil colonization than woody plant like a tree or a shrub. Having some evergreens helps prevent erosion and gives the rain garden winter interest. Evergreens will actively take up water in the winter, whereas a deciduous plant will not, since it's not photosynthesizing until it has leaves. You can tell that this rain garden is a plant lover. This is the very large rain garden of a master gardener friend in Kitsap County. It has lots of flowering plants, as you can see, a variety of textures and plant types. It's quite showy. This was taken a year after the rain garden was installed, so I imagine now it is completely filled in. It's those flowering plants that add color, but also provide food for pollinators. For rain gardens in the front yard or seen from the house, these are some of the go-to flowering plants that are commonly used and are also in the plant list for the handbook. Once you've selected and purchased your plants, it's time to get them into the ground. And for big rain gardens like this one in the picture, it's wonderful to use flags to mark your spacing and plant locations for the different types of plants. Make sure you give all the plant pots a deep and thorough watering on the day of the planting. This will make sure that they're nice and moist when they go in the ground. And as you plant each plant, make sure that you tease the roots apart. Loosen those roots, especially if they're root bound. And then you're gonna place them so that the crown or main stem is at the same level in the ground as it was in that plant pot. We know that not loosening the roots and planting too deep are two of the most common reasons for new plant failure. And then after that, not watering enough in the summer to establish them is another reason that new plants die. Once all your plants are in, gently water each individual plant well. The added benefit of watering in each plant like that is that you might find a plant or two that settle in too deep, and then you can adjust them when that happens. Or with big plantings, and I've seen this happen frequently, you'll find one that made it out of its pot, <laughs> but didn't actually get into the ground. Once the plants are in and watered, it's time to put a two to three inch layer of mulch placed strategically by hand so as not to bury the plant's crown. Don't be tempted to spread the mulch before planting. I've been on sites where we've tried to do this and it makes it almost impossible to plant correctly. In this top picture, compost is used for the mulch and it does have a very attractive appearance but it may promote heavy weed colonization because it's so rich and nutrient laden. 
arborist chips really, I think, make the best rain garden mulch. Don't use bark mulch because bark floats and it can block your outflow. Once you've mulched, gently water in the whole rain garden to settle everything. You'll want to watch carefully the first few storms to make sure everything fills and flows out properly. It may take a storm or two for everything to settle in and for the rain garden to drain as rapidly as it was designed and planned. You're likely to notice that your rain garden drains faster over the years as plants become larger and more established as that combo of plants, soil, and microorganisms becomes well-developed and functioning. Maintenance of rain gardens is similar to other garden installations. For this helpful publication, there's a link in your handout, details things specific to rain gardens, including seasonally important tasks. If any of you out there have a rain garden already and have maintenance questions, I'd like to help with those based on what I've seen over the years. So I hope you'll ask those questions in the chat box. Just like all gardens, rain gardens need weeding and summer watering. Those two things are especially important in the first few years as plants fill in and become established. Adding mulch is needed, helps weeds be suppressed and keeps plant roots cool. Keeping inflows and outflows free and clear of debris and cutting plants away from those is particularly important, especially at the beginning of the rainy season. Tall ornamental grasses in particular should be cut back after flowering since they can produce a lot of debris. One of the things that's important maintenance wise is to keep foot traffic out of the rain garden. When you design and plan, strategically placing large stepping stones is a practical way to keep our footsteps concentrated so as not to compact the rain garden when we get in to maintain it. If you find people are walking through your rain garden, you might need to construct more obvious paths on either side of it, place a visible railing to block foot traffic, or maybe even add a bridge if it's in your garden. There's lots of ways to design a rain garden to get people to, to move around it. Sometimes it's difficult if you have a rain garden that's close to a sidewalk. Before we open it up to questions, quickly I wanna say that if a rain garden is not an option for your particular site, or even if it is, there are many other easy ways we can protect our precious water resources, water quality and quantity both. And these are just some of the ideas. Uh, there's also all the other green stormwater techniques like planting trees and using rain barrels or cisterns. Okay, so that concludes Let It All Soak In, my into garden, introduction to rain gardens. And I'm going to put my video back on. There we are. And I'm hoping that Erica, who's been monitoring the chat box, will be able to give us any questions that I might be able to answer, any clarifications, maybe some maintenance questions. Yeah, there aren't many that are coming in yet, uh, except that there's a question about where to access the Rain Garden Handbook. Um, someone's asking about posting the link for the handout, but we're gonna send that via email afterwards. So uh, who put together that handbook and where can one find that? So the handbook, can be found through the Department of Ecology online. And you can Google the Rain Garden Handbook for Western Washington. And it's a, uh, it's a relatively large PDF that can be downloaded. It was a collaboration between Washington State University and all sorts of different agencies with lots of different educators and horticulturists and scientists involved. Um, I'm trying to think of the year that it was, was redone, but it should be fairly easy to, to find online. The link to it was in the slides. So if you watch the Rain Garden Handbook again, or watch this video again, you can have that. Or if you get the handout from Erica, it's available. What was the other question you, you asked, Erica? Oh, well, so there's one other question. It says, um, what do you recommend for turf grass border and how deep does it need to be? That is a really great question. And 
it's very important. That the person who's asking this question is probably familiar with the challenges of not edging a lawn next to any kind of garden bed, but especially next to a rain garden. Um, on the market, sadly, there aren't a lot of options that are good. Most of them are pretty darn shallow. And to keep turf grass from invading garden beds and from invading rain gardens, you need a good six inches deep. So um, I think one of the slides that I showed previously, and I'll see if I can go back here and find it, um, some of the ways rain gardens have been edged. Um, this one here is actually a curb. So it is a poured concrete curb. And that's a little extreme and maybe not always accessible uh, to a homeowner, but that is a great way um, when it's a good six inches deep to for sure keep the grass out of the rain garden. Uh, let's see, I know I, here's one where they're using um, stacking block to create a barrier. And you can dig these in pretty deep, uh, depending on the size of the blocks that you get. And you can make a nice edging that way. A lot of people will move, will just allow maybe a foot for uh, that's mulch soil, and then they continually manually edge it but have it back far enough so that if you miss it for a few weeks, your grass won't get into the rain garden in leaps and bounds. But definitely, if you're gonna border, if you're gonna have a rain garden installed in a lawn, you wanna have an edging of some sort. Thanks, Colleen. So, so someone is asking um, to confirm, you don't wanna build a rain garden on a slope? Our gutters drain to a central place in our front yard, but there is quite a slope to this spot. From that spot, it drains to a culvert that flows to a creek. Oh, okay. So yes, yeah, so generally the rule of thumb is that a rain garden shouldn't be installed in an area that's greater than a 10% slope. And I didn't include any of the slides from the rain garden handbook regarding building a rain garden on a slope, but it can be done and there are techniques to do it. You have to berm up the low end of the rain garden and really have well stabilized soil so that it doesn't blow out and erode away. But it is possible on slopes if they aren't too steep. If you want to include a rain garden in a steep area, sometimes you can have a, land, a professional landscaper help you with some of those more difficult situations uh, to be able to make that possible. And I've seen uh, different landscape designers use things like the compost socks that they can make um, earthen retaining walls out of and various other techniques where you're using not just one rain garden, but maybe a series of rain gardens that are at different levels. Um, but again, um, sometimes these ways of putting rain gardens on slopes are a little more challenging and might take a professional's eye and expertise to make happen. But the rain garden handbook does have information on rain gardens on slopes uh, and and that's helpful. Great, thanks, Colleen. Um, someone is asking, does a rain garden increase the chance of slug and snail problems? <laughs> oh gosh, that is a good question. Um, any moist garden area where you have a lot of plants is gonna address slugs. Um, I don't think there'd be any more in a rain garden than they would be elsewhere in the rain garden. Uh, but I do know that rain gardens that are in shadier locations that you do get, get slugs um, and in urban areas that have snails, sometimes snails. And so choosing your selection of plants for a shady rain garden is sometimes more difficult um, because we're tempted to use some of the really fabulous, uh, beautiful, um, ornamental plants like ligularias and things like that that are soil magnets even if 
you know, even if they were in the desert, the slug would appear. So um, that is always a challenge with rain gardens, sure. So someone is asking if you can recommend places that they could go to see an established rain garden or maybe a demonstration garden. And Colleen, I don't know if you've ever set foot in Clark County. We just don't seem to have a lot of them here, which is partly why I wanted to do this workshop because it would be great to see more of them around. Do you happen to know in the Portland area or um, down south here? Um, you know, I haven't visited any of your rain gardens in the area. Forgive me for distracting me go through, going through the slide, but I wanted to show you something that I think I had a slide here. No, I don't. So let's go back. Um, so public works stormwater, which this is a screenshot from my, from my phone on the left-hand side. On that website, and I believe the stormwater partners website, which is on the far right of your screen. Again, this is a screenshot from, from my phone. Um, I believe it's the public works stormwater actually has a map that you can go in real time and it will show you all of the green stormwater solutions that are in Clark County. And I was looking at it the other day and I'm sorry I didn't include um, a screenshot of that map. But um, most of those, I think, were bioretention, not rain gardens, because these are public facilities that they're sending you to. But they can show you, you know, they can still be a really good example of what can be done with, with um, a rain garden on private property. And if not the Public Works stormwater site, the stormwater partners for Southwest Washington would be a good place to also look. And I bet you they have a map as well so that you can go out and you can see um, some of these installations in your community. And I was pretty impressed. There were a lot of them on the map. Most of them concentrated in the Vancouver area, but um, I haven't actually been to any of them, but uh, I, I know that there's a map there for you to be able to go and check the ones out that are in your area. I'll mention that uh, one rain garden that I am aware of is at the Washougal Library. So uh, for those of you who live in, nearer in Washougal, they do have a, a neat little one there that is cut, it's, it's well done. So you can kind of get the gist of the design and all that. Nice, Eric, um, does, does that one have interpretive signage as well? I don't believe it does. It's been a while since I've seen it, but I don't believe that it does. Okay, more and more it, um, when, the counties and cities are putting in these facilities. They are um, providing beautiful signs so that people can put what they're seeing in context and understand the um, what is going on there, that, that it's not just a beautiful garden, that it has a stormwater function. And so hopefully some of the ones that, that are on the map in your area also have that because it, it builds a context when you're looking at the rain garden or the bioretention um, and understand how it functions. Great. We've got a couple more here. Um, someone's asking, we have a creek bed that we created to channel water on our sloped yard. Can we have the inf can we have that be the inflow to a rain garden? So it's it's not a natural stream. It's um, kind of a uh, something that you have created in your garden to channel water through your property. If that's if I'm understanding that situation right. Certainly you could um, deposit that into an area where it would infiltrate and slow instead of just running by. And that would be ideal. Of course, if, if, you're, if your area is pretty sloped, it might not be possible to do that, but it, um, I'm liking how your, your brain is, is working, just kind of figuring out, hmm, how can I make this happen on my property? And that's, that's the fun part about doing this is that every site is a little bit different and you can have um, interesting ways of getting the water into the rain garden that um, might look like a creek bed like you have. She says that it's a dry creek most of okay. the year. Then yes, absolutely. If, if it flows over a long area, uh, one of the things that I have seen done as an inflow um, over the ground into a rain garden is to line it with some kind of a plastic and put rocks on it so that um, that water can flow mostly into a rain garden. But if it's, 
if it's sinking into the ground as it flows to the rain garden, that's just as, that's just as well. And so uh, I, I like how you're thinking. I think it might be possible to do something like that. There's a question that says, what is the issue with being too close to a drain field? Physical barriers, i.e. hitting the pipes or saturating the drain field? Oh, excellent question. So with a drain field, you don't want to direct your, your downspouts or put a rain garden near the drain field because as you suspected, it can compromise your drain field. If the soil in your drain field is saturated, um, either because of, of having a rain garden and putting a lot of volume of water there, that means that sometimes your septic effluent could end up coming to the surface of the soil, which means it's not getting treated, it's not getting cleaned, and it can become a public health issue. And it could cause the failure of that septic drain field. So uh, we want to be um, a good deal away from a septic drain field, as well as the tank itself. And I do have a slide that talks a little bit about septic system information. Here's where you find it. Um, but there's another public health menu for land records, but here we go. So you want to be 30 feet downhill or uphill, it doesn't matter, 30 feet away from a septic drain field or reserve drain field. And that also includes your neighbor's drain field. Um, and then you want to be a minimum of 10 feet away from your septic tank. So you can be a little bit closer to the septic tank, but it's the drain field that we really want to protect for obvious reasons. Great question, thank you. She says that's perfect, thank you. Of course. Uh, I'm wondering if it would be okay to go ahead and launch the poll right now and let folks work on that. And then um, other folks could put in maybe questions if they have some lingering ones. Great idea. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit launch. It should appear on your screen. Um, so give it just a second and go ahead and uh, go through the seven questions. And as you answer uh, each, you can scroll down and choose a new uh, question. And it should start telling us um, uh, how many people have participated. Um, once you're done with that, if you have other questions, you can post those in the chat. Okay, I'm starting to see some answers coming in. Thank you, looking good. I'm also posting a couple items in the chat. One is a link to the Clark County Green Neighbors website. Um, they've got a really neat suite of uh, resources there for you, including a newsletter that you, you can subscribe to that comes out just once a month and is very helpful. Um, and I've put my uh, email address here as well. If you're not on our mailing list and you'd like to find out about our events, send me an email and ask to be put on our mailing list. Um, I send out about one um, email a month and the Master Gardener Foundation also sends out a couple of emails about their events as well. So um, go ahead and just let me know if you'd like to do that. Looks like we're about at the halfway point. Uh, so those of you who are done, if you'd like to put questions in the chat box, I'll go ahead and read those to Colleen. Uh, and I appreciate the rest of you Completing those. We're getting some thank yous coming in. Some appreciations. Nicely done, lots of good information. Looking forward to downloading those different resources. Yeah, that Rain Garden Handbook is a fantastic book. Uh, it really does walk you through step by step. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming in, just more thanks. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending this evening's workshop. 
Um, I don't have any more scheduled right now, but we will certainly be planning more as the summer goes on. And uh, as I mentioned, the Master Gardener Foundation, who is the nonprofit that supports our program, will be continuing to put on their monthly uh, presentations as well that are educational. So um, hope to see you at an, uh, an upcoming event. Thank you so much, Colleen. This was really fantastic, really helpful, um, and really uh, enjoyable and beautiful. Thank you, Erica. Likewise. I appreciate it, and I hope everybody has a lovely evening. Okay. Good night. Good night.